Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. And we pray for your presence to be here with us. God, we ask for your word to be written on our hearts. Help us to hear and understand what you have for us today. And that we would learn something through your word, God. In Jesus. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live in christ alone who took on flesh fullness of god in helpless faith Thank you, Lord, for your song. Thank you, Lord. All right, so we are going through Genesis 40 and 41. Again, continuing with Joseph's life and story. And just remembering as we read how that even though he was taken into slavery and he was imprisoned, God always had favor on him. As we read this, we'll see how Joseph was used over and over because of God. And we understand that through these stories that God sent Joseph to Egypt, even though it went in the, you know, he went in the shoes of a slave and he became imprisoned and all the things that he endured. Ultimately, there was salvation coming and it was to save the children of Israel through this mission that Joseph would be sent on. He was 17, if you recall, when he was first put into slavery. And we understand that he was 30 later in the scriptures where he was given the governorship. So he was exalted in a later time. But before that, his imprisonment time, he was 28 years old. So he ultimately spent 11 years as a slave from 17 until 28 before he was imprisoned. And something we can think about is how he kept himself in the ways of God and in integrity throughout all that time, even from a young man of 17 and having to endure all that he had to endure through that time. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody 
in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And originally the captain of the guard had put Joseph in a position of overseeing prisoners and gave him full responsibility and didn't worry about what he was doing. He didn't even look in on him. He allowed him to have his way in that, uh, in that responsibility. So now this butler and baker have been put into prison because of something that they did to offend the um, Pharaoh. The captain of the guard charged Joseph with them. So he said, I want you to take care of this butler and this uh, baker. And the, and when he gave him that charge, he said to serve them. So they were in custody for a while. We don't know how long that was because we do know that Joseph was given the governorship at 30. So there was just that two year span or uh, period of time. Uh, now, as far as how long there was between Joseph and the butler and Baker being in prison together and this actual event that's occurring now, that's the part that we're not certain about if that was a couple of years or what it was. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream. Both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with its own interpretation. Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in the custody of his lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. So at this point, here's Joseph, and he's got full confidence in his ability to interpret dreams, to discern what the dream would be, because he just told them, Do not interpretations belong to God? He also was make that confirmation because in Egypt, it was very common for there to be um, people that would be telling what a dream meant, but they were using witchcraft to do it as well as some of the wise men. None of them were doing it by God. They had these big books that they used to figure out um, different types of things, but this was one of the things that they would figure out. So Joseph made it very clear to them that only God can truly interpret a dream. And if we think back in Genesis, as we've been reading, any dream that was ever ever interpreted was God's doing, that, that we knew that the dream was real, that, that the answer to that dream was real, because when it was interpreted, that interpretation came true. And in Deuteronomy, it even speaks about if there is a prophet that tells something and that thing does not come to pass, he is a false prophet and you don't have to fear him. But if he tells something and it comes to pass, then you need to fear him. He has the power of God. In this same regard, in the interpretation of dreams, Joseph made it very clear that the only one that can interpret dreams, the only one that knows, truly knows is God. There's a lot of people out there that are doing this interpreting of dreams, even to this day. And the best thing for you to do is to take your cares before the Lord. And also, as it says, if this, if a person is acting or speaking for the Lord, then you know it's true. If you know it came from God, if you see that that interpretation comes to pass. So he said, tell these dreams to me. He knew that he could interpret them already. He was, there was no doubt. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, behold, in my dream, a vine was before me and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded. Its blossoms shot forth and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said to him, 
this is the interpretation of it. He didn't walk away and go spend time with God in prayer or anything. He immediately had the understanding. That is the power of God. That is truly what God is able to give us when we follow after him and, and when he uses us in that way. Joseph said, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now, within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. And also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in a dream in my dream. And there were three white baskets on my head in the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. So Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river, seven cows, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven uh, fine looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time. And suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men. So this was the first thing that people would do. They would go looking for these people that are, you know, doing magic or, or uh, whatever they're doing. And that is through the spirit of Satan. That has nothing to do with God. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one, none of them could interpret those dreams for him. Then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. We each had a dream in one night, he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him and he interpreted our, our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us. So it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothes, and came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there was no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you can interpret a dream to interpret it understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt, such ugliness as I had never seen in all of the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows. When they had eaten them up, no one would have known that they had eaten them. 
for they were just as ugly as at the beginning. So I awoke. Also, I saw in my dream suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the thin heads devoured the seven good heads. So I told this to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years and the seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. And the seven thin and ugly cows which came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty heads blighted by the east wind are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, seven years of famine will arise and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the foods of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there was no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house. All my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. So we see how God strategically placed Joseph in this situation where from a slave to someone imprisoned, to being made as a prince in the house of Pharaoh, to be given this type of power that he ultimately would be able to be uh, uh, in control of all of those things to give to the Israelites and that he would assist in not allowing them to perish. Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried out before him, Bow the knee, for he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zophnoth Panai and gave him as a wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the foods of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city, the food of the fields, which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting for it was immeasurable. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, who Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty, 
which were in the land of Egypt, ended. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the lands. And we can understand through this that we've read what God did, the favor that he put upon Joseph. He had a lot of time of waiting. And there's often times when we have things that we feel God is doing and we're in a waiting period and we don't see how it's coming to pass. We don't, we can't decipher what God's plan is, but God makes a perfect plan. He doesn't fail. His plan is always perfect. It's always good. It's always righteous. It's always gracious. God is able to complete the plan that he has. He doesn't think in the same way we do, like in succession. He has a perfect way to establish a plan for our lives. And all he asks us to do is trust. And we can see this revealed in Joseph's life, even from a young man, 17 years old. We've all known teenagers. <laughs> and at that age, a young man, you know, that's not an easy thing. But he devoted his life and his heart. And he was, he was full of integrity when he dealt with uh, Pharaoh's wife and she you know, was tempting him over and over and over. I mean, every single day she was trying to, you know, convince him even to the point when they were alone in the house and she cried rape and, um, he had nothing to do with her. He was not guilty of that. Um, and so all of this was a falsehood that was brought to his life, but ultimately what was meant for evil, God already had a plan of good. That's the part that we have to remember that God's plan is his and he's the one with the knowledge of it. When he sets it in place, you know, we have an enemy that wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. So he keeps doing his thing. And and when the scripture says what God, you know, meant what Satan meant for evil, God get, made good. He already had that good plan. And Satan just keeps trying to stir things up to turn things over to evil. But if we continue in faith and continue in believing in the Lord and keeping our eyes turned to God, no matter what we're facing, no matter what circumstances, we can trust that God has an ultimate plan and that he is wonderful, wise, and perfect in all of his ways. And we just thank the Lord for that today. Amen.